So good afternoon, everybody. This is the Vermont Senate's Institutions Committee. Today is January 22nd, the year 2021. We are live on YouTube. My name is Joe Benning. I'm the chair of this committee. We also have with us Senator Mazza from Grand Isle, Senator McCormick from Windsor County, Senator Parent from Franklin County, Senator Ingalls from Essex Orleans. Um, I'm going to remind the public who may be watching, this is a YouTube channel that is family oriented. If you choose to make comments about what you hear, it would be greatly appreciated if you keep in the back of your mind that your comments may be seen by those of tender age. So we would appreciate keeping everything civil. We're here to talk a little bit about corrections this afternoon. And for our witnesses, let me say that we have three new members of this committee and one brand spanking new senator. So basically, um, especially with respect to the secretary and the commissioner, uh, we are looking for probably a 50,000 foot level view of your job descriptions. And we'll get into some conversation that goes a little more detailed into that. But the idea here for the new senators on this committee, as well as the public at large, is to give us a basic description of who you are how you fit into state government and how you might fit into the capital bill as we go forward. With that, um, if I'm taking in rank, it would begin this afternoon with Secretary Mike Smith. Sorry, Jim, you, you've been outranked on that one score. Um, but if we could get some basic introductory remarks, Mike may, we may end up asking a lot more detailed questions, but again, it's a 50,000 foot level of who you are, how you fit into this picture, and we'll take it from there. Sure, I'm trying to figure that out right now um, in terms of uh, who I am and where I, where I fit in. But the, I am uh, Mike Smith, for the record, uh, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. For those who are relatively new, um, the, uh, the agency, um, is uh, quite expansive in its portfolio. It has, um, you know, the various um, departments, it has six departments, and I'll go through those in a minute. It has a budget of about $2.6 billion. All funds has about 3,500 employees uh, and ranges from anything that, deal, that touches Vermonters in many, many ways. For example, the, um, the Department of Vermont Health Access, the Medicaid department is within our, our purview. And also the, the health exchanges um, are run out of uh, DIVA. The Department of Health, and you've been reading a lot about the Department of Health or seeing a lot about the Department of Health during the pandemic led by uh, uh, Commissioner Mark Levine. Uh, the Department of Mental Health, making sure that the mental health um, of Vermonters is uh, is taken care of, and for those that need hospitalization, running facilities for those for those individuals. Sarah Squirrel is the commissioner there. Um, DCF um, is another one. Children's and Families, and the commissioner is Sean Brown, um, a fairly large um, organization, as well as uh, Dale, the Department of Aging and Independent Living. And of course, we'll be talking today with the Department of Corrections, and that is a uh, fairly significant um, uh, uh, operation as well. Just to give you some sense of the, the size, um, if you're looking, you know, like I said, it's a $2.6 billion budget. Um, the the um, DIVA is all funds, mostly federal funds because of Medicaid. It, the size of it is about $972 million. The Department of Health is, is about $163 million. Department of Mental Health is $277 million. Uh, Children and Families is $425 million in terms of their budget. Um, the Department of uh, Aging and Independent Living is $532 million. And then, of course, the Department of Corrections, which is unusual in its way, in many ways, because it's $168 million budget, 153 of that is general fund. Um, there isn't a lot of federal funds within the uh, 
within the Department of Corrections um, budget. I'll just tell you a little bit of, uh, about myself for the new, uh, for the people that are new. Um, I, this is my second rodeo. It's my second term, time around as the, uh, the secretary here at, at the agency. I was once the Secretary of Administration and then Secretary of Human Services, and then back again to be Secretary of Administration. And then I told Senator Mazza that I'd never be back to state government, and here I am. Um, but um, the, I, I, I've just got to say this, um, you know, to sort, of, to sort of pinpoint what this agency does, is we help Vermonters and we protect Vermonters, um, as Jim will talk about, and and that protection is is we're going to start talking about protection in terms of helping people that are in our custody as well uh, as we move forward. But this uh, this you know I've had a lot of jobs in my career, a lot of jobs. Um, this is probably the best job I ever had or ever will have. Um, I'm getting, as you can tell with the hair, I'm getting close uh, to uh, ending this, um, you know, this run of uh, jobs at some point, not, not real soon, but at no, some point. And, <laughs> and this, is a, uh, this is a wonderful job because you help people. And that is, that is something I, I think that's noble. We've all been in situations in our lives, my, in, in my younger years when I was uh, pretty much a troublemaker, always in trouble. Um, and pretty much, you know, there's been points in my life, uh, you know, and a lot of you have heard this before, um, but for those new members, you know, it, 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 I had a family that split apart, you know, when I was a teenager, primarily because my father um, had a was an alcoholic, um, couldn't control it. Finally, drank himself to death. Um, so you you have that aspect of your life. You have the aspect. I've been broke uh, before. Um, um, you, the you know the aspect of uh, being homeless, um, not in the sense of being out on the streets. I was never that, but going from couch to couch and being able to relate to that. And many of us have struggled. Um, in, in our lives at, at some point. But the one thing that's been different with me at least than anybody else, I think than other people is the fact that I've always had people to turn to. I've always had friends. I've always had family that helped me out. Many Vermonters don't have that. And the fact is this agency is that friend, is that family. And I take that job pretty seriously as uh, we move forward. Now, speaking about um, corrections, um, we take that job pretty seriously too, um, as we move forward. And as we look at corrections, I think we're gonna be talking about a new women's facility in here. Um, but um, as we look at corrections, you know, we really have to figure out how do we keep people um, you know, keep Vermonters safe from people that have done bad things, but also rehabilitate those that are in the facility to make sure they succeed once once they leave. So I, I think I've I think I've given you way too much uh, from, from perhaps my my point of view. But um, uh, is that what you wanted, Mr. Chair? That's a pretty good overview. And before I turn to the committee to ask what they want to ask, um, what is that over your right shoulder? That picture seems to be a team of some kind. This is um, in uh, in SEAL team. You have a thing called um, Bud's you training. It was a SEAL, that's it. Yeah, uh, you have a, a Bud's training um, and. We started out with a class of about 156 and we graduated 17 and that's the 17. So uh, that was, uh, that's the, uh, that's the picture. You, you seem to have left out that significant part of your life. Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he always does that. <laughs> Very modest. Um, if you could just give us a, a, a really high overview of your department and how it is divided into different sections? 
Um, are you talking to me yes. or? Yes, uh, we'll, we'll get into Jim's department as well. Well, you know, like I said, just said, we have, I have six departments and, and in the agency and then the secretary's office, which has, you know, a, um, that has uh, uh, 61 people within the secretary's office. The secretary's office is divided into having um, health reform is within the secretary's office as a director of health reform within the secretary's office. All the financial operations for the agency is in the secretary's office, as well as a deputy um, and several um, uh, principal assistants that are that are in there and, and 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 some other stuff that deal with personnel and other things that are just in the secretary's office. Just to give you some scope, uh, Diva has 376 employees. Department of Health has 529 employees. Department of Mental Health has 269 employees. Uh, DCF has 991 employees. Dale has uh, 271. And the big gorilla is uh, the Department of Corrections, which has 1,000, roughly 1,021 employees as we move forward. Now, within DCF, there's various departments, there are, uh, various divisions within uh, DCF as well. There's, uh, for example, Economic Opportunity Division. There's the Family Services Division. There's various divisions within each uh, department. So, as you're, as you can tell, um, it's a fairly expansive agency. Um, many of the departments in the agency, most of the departments in the agency, are as big as any other agency in state government. So it's it's good size. So I'm kind of curious, do you have like on a wall at home, a really big kind of family tree diagram to remind you of who all the players are? <laughs> um, I can remember Jim Baker. So that's Commissioner Baker. So that's, that's good. Um, I, I do have an org chart that I have and we'll make sure you get an org chart because for the new members that that's probably a, a, a pretty good thing to have. Um, it, it would be actually. We yeah. We'll make sure you. We'll make sure you get an org chart. Thank you very much. Committee, do you have any questions, comments, snide remarks? No, nope, Mike does a good job and uh, he, uh, he buckles down and does it and uh, he's gonna keep around a long time. <laughs> uh, how are you handling the quarantine situation? Um, <laughs> it's, I, my wife is loving it. I'm down in a basement <laughs> sort of, uh, apartment like, uh, situations and I get a knock on the door and the food comes in and that's oh, about it. wrong with that? <laughs> you get to order it or you just get whatever comes? <laughs> it's just whatever comes. I, I, I will say this and I, at the risk of being on YouTube, um, <clears throat> it, it, I understand, I really do understand what you know, thousands of Vermonters have, have had to go through. And, you know, it's, in a way, it's good to, um, to experience this, so. Questions? Senator McCormick. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I think one of the smartest things that your legislature has done in the last year is deciding to cooperate with the administration on COVID. I think mm -hmm. you folks have done good leadership and I'm glad we've made that decision. I've worked really hard at not offering the benefit of my wisdom, uh, but I will be sending you a memo. I just wanna draw your attention to it on the using age as the sole criterion for getting the vaccine. Um, I think that overlooks the fact that there are people with comorbidities. You know, 75 is a cutoff. I've got a constituent who's 74 and a half with cancer. And I think she's more vulnerable than someone over 75. And I know you're not dealing directly with that. There's more Dr. Levine and, and the governor, but it is ultimately in your shop. So, yeah. Okay, no, I, I, just, I, so, I, I do appreciate that. And, and if I may, I just... Um, we went with the age bands, um, and I wholeheartedly supported them. So I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Senator. You know, we looked at this um, from a uh, from a data point of view, and 
over 70% of Vermont's uh, COVID-19 deaths have been Vermonters um, over the age of 75, and more than 90% are over the age of 65. And hospitalizations have been by far uh, those that have been over the age of uh, 65. So we just looked at the data and I understand, you know, that there are other groups that want it. And we, we just said, you know, vaccinating at, you know, given this facts, these facts and with the limited number of doses that we're receiving from the federal government, we just felt we had a moral obligation to take this age-based approach first. And, and, and again, I think vaccinating at risk for monitors first also helps us to get out of this faster because we can we can concentrate on making sure that that if we can um, slow down the death rate, slow down the hospitalization rate, slow down the complications, um, we'll make a further gain into this to this system. So um, I was um, I was a proponent of the age banding. I'll, I'll admit to that, and I'll, I'll look forward to your letter. Will I speak as a 73 year old man with the body of a Greek god? <laughs> Something about that age where they start to hallucinate, it just incredible to watch. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, don't, don't go too far down there because I'm not that far behind uh, Senator McCormick. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually glad that he asked the question because I, I'd like you to put something else into the back of your mind about this very subject. And this morning we were uh, in judiciary facing an incredible avalanche somewhere down the road when we finally get past the virus. But in the meantime, the judicial branch of government has come almost to a standstill. And there are so many cases now pending awaiting trials that it is really going to have a major impact on virtually every dollar we have in government. And I'm very much concerned that we start a process somehow to chip away at the iceberg that will be coming down in the not too distant future. So the, the thought that I had was, if you're putting up a priority list of people who should get the vaccine, getting court staff vaccinated, including the lawyers, and I'm not speaking for myself at the moment, although I happen to be one, the upshot is we've got to start something by way of moving jury trials forward. And it's impacting right now our next speaker. How do we get this system to start to move and get some of the relief from the pressure it's feeling? So the upshot, we've got to start someplace to get the judicial branch of government moving. I would submit and I would hope you consider that the judicial personnel who would be surrounding those jury trials get vaccinated. We then can look at the age cohort that has been vaccinated and take those people and put them into a jury pool. That's the easiest way to begin to take shots at getting that avalanche to decrease. And I don't know if I'm articulating it right because I've been talking a lot today, but there is um, a method of taking baby steps towards relieving the pressure on the judicial branch of government. When we can't have trials, all the leverage that we would normally use to settle cases is gone. Most cases where there's any question about the plea agreement that's being offered go right up to the door and day of a jury drawing. Without that there, in both the criminal and the civil uh, situations, they don't have any leverage to settle their cases. And that's what's going on right now. All of these cases have come to a stop. It doesn't matter only for those people who are incarcerated because a, a great many times when somebody is brought up on charges, they are issued conditions of release. They range from almost nothing all the way up to you're on a 24 hour curfew at home. So you've got a whole lot of people out there and they're looking at their cases thinking, I would really like to take this to trial. 
Normally, when they get to the day of a jury drawing, they get cold feet, we settle cases. That leverage is not there. The same thing is happening in civil trials, where insurance companies are really desirous of not going to trial. So things get dragged on. And I'm only sending out this signal that whoever is in the process of making decisions about what cohort comes next in the vaccines, give some serious consideration to those court personnel, and then we can start moving trials again. That's my rant for the- We've Got a lot of lawyers in Vermont, we got to vaccinate. Well, only the ones who were actually involved in the court system. You know, that, that narrows it down considerably. But you know, like, we're facing questions like what buildings are, are HVAC uh, satisfactory? And then we have to spend money to change the HVAC systems. That's not gonna solve the problem if you still can't develop the personnel to get the trials moving. So rather than concentrating on the physical plant, you've gotta be able to put people in the current physical plants that are protected. And that's the whole philosophy behind my suggesting you might wanna just roll that around and think about it. Mike, didn't you just get off the press conference? I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let, um, Senator, I, I understand your your position, and, and um, I appreciate what you said. We, you know, we've had we've got hundreds of groups coming to us and saying, you know, we we're essential and we need to be vaccinated, and we just thought um, that this was the least divisive and most. Um, fairest way and the and and sort of the the moral way to go after um, those people that are likely to die. Um, so we are going 75 and above, then 70 above, then 65 above, and then um, and then those with underlying conditions. I will say this because the governor said this today. After that, I think there's um, there's room to talk about the various things that we can we can talk about, but we really have put a premium on keeping people alive in in this in in this regard. And the numbers are the numbers. Yeah, I, I do understand the logic. I'm not trying to criticize the logic. I'm watching with growing concern. The judicial branch of government is going to have a major problem in front of it. Already does now, but as you get those individual cohorts of people vaccinated they then would become available to serve as jurors. The only remaining obstacle would be the personnel in the courthouse that would be required to deal with those jurors as they become available. And so in trying to get from here to there, because we don't have a panacea or a magic brush to get from here to there quickly, we've got to start chipping away. And if you get those people vaccinated, we can socially distance other people who come into the courtroom and do things like set up plastic barriers and require masks for them. But it's one way to start chipping away at a big problem that's coming down the pike. I've ranted long enough on this particular subject, so we probably should move on to the guy who's gonna be responsible for all of this. Commissioner, good afternoon. And you're muted, sir. There you go. Good afternoon, Senator, how are you? Oh, peachy. For the record, uh, my name is James Baker, and I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And uh, I'll give I'll give the, the secretary has touched on a lot of what corrections um, is about as far as the budget and staff. And uh, I'll give a little bit about my background for the new committee members. Um, you know, un unfortunately, I, I, I've been around long enough that I've dealt with several of the senators here <laughs> for a long period of time. And uh, uh, I've been working in Vermont since 1978. Uh, largest part of my career in state government was sent, spent with the state police, where I spent 31 years. I retired in 2009 as the colonel director of the state police, and uh, then went on to do some um, work that um, I often refer refer to as um, um, cleanup jobs. I was at the police academy for my criminal justice training council for about a year and a half um, as a result of a suicide of a staff member there. And then um, <clears throat> I've done some consulting in between, spent three years as the police chief in Rutland, um, and, uh, and then uh, went on to work in the Washington DC area for three years 
on the executive staff of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and uh, was doing some co consulting when my phone rang in December of 2019 and Secretary Smith was at the other end uh, when he asked me if I'd be interested in being the interim commissioner of corrections for 120 days. <laughs> and uh, I started on, on uh, January 6th of 2020. And if all of you can do math, you'll know that's not 120 days. Did, did you read the small print? Yeah, did you read the small print? <laughs> that's the problem, Senator. I didn't sign a contract with him. You know how that goes with the secretary. So, um, but, but on all seriousness, you know, we didn't expect to have um, a pandemic, the largest pandemic known to our, our lifetimes. Um, and the, uh, the fallout from that, and Senator, I'm, I'm listening to your point about the criminal justice system and the challenges. And um, you all know, many of you that are on the committee have heard me talk last year about the work that was being done early on in the pandemic. And, um, you know, I'm very proud to say that the, 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 uh, the employees of the Vermont Department of Corrections have worked so hard that we're seen as one of the cleanest systems in the country. Um, you know, we have a positive test here and there, but um, it's, it's aggressive testing. Um, we test to suppress, and uh, as soon as we get a positive, we have a rapid response team internally with the Vermont Department of Health. And I wanna make this point about why it's so important where correction sits in the system in Vermont. Um, so we've done a lot of hard work over the last year, and uh, we continue to do a lot of hard work. Uh, again, just for a way of understanding corrections, we have six jails in the state of Vermont, six facilities um, located in uh, St. Albans, uh, Newport, St. Johnsbury, uh, South Burlington, Chittenden, which is the women's facility, which um, our, our uh, colleagues from DRR, DRM they heard talk about today. Um, we have a facility in Rutland and a facility in Springfield. And we also contract with a contractor, Core Civic, where we house inmates in uh, Tallahatchie, Mississippi um, at, at a facility there. That's one side of our operation. The other side of our operation is we're, we, we are a system unlike some states where we also have probation and parole. And so in, in the system right now, jailed as of today, in the facilities are uh, 1,288 individuals. And um, out of those, to, to uh, Senator Benning's point, 364 of those individuals that are currently in custody in a facility are detained individuals. And out of that 364, somewhere around 60 plus or minus are federal detainee inmates that we have a relationship with the US Marshal Service to detain federal detainees. Um, on a probation and parole side of the house, we have 11 offices around the state. Um, where we supervise people that are on furlough, parole, and probation. And um, right now, I, I don't have the exact number, but we're somewhere around 5,900 plus or minus individuals that we supervise in the community. And when the secretary talked about our role in public safety, that's part of our role in public safety is the supervision of those individuals in communities. Um, we, we, we do programming, um, we work with our partners. Um, Vermont Corrections Department is one of the leaders in the country on restorative justice practices. Um, we fund and support regional criminal justice centers where they do a lot of that restorative work. We have contracts with um, um, groups that provide housing for us on transitional housing. Um, and we do work around programming, around violence, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and uh, substance abuse. And so um, that's in essence who we are, but also we run about a $20 million healthcare system. Um, our contract with our, our provider, so the secretary told you is $168 million contract, 20 million of that before we do anything else goes to a contractor, roughly 20 million. I think this past year it was 19, somewhere in the ballpark of $20 million goes to a healthcare provider where we provide healthcare to individuals within our system. And we also operate a high school inside our system and we operate uh, an industry. We, we do furniture, signs and metal work, print shop, all within our system. So let me just, in a way of keep it at the 10,000 foot view and then I'll move on for folks to ask questions. Um, 
it's important. Um, I, I've spent 45 years in the justice system. I guess longer than that if I keep do all the complete math. But I've always worked at the front end of the system in law enforcement. This is the first time I've ever worked at the back end of the system. Um, where, where we have individuals that we house that are in, you know, by statute in my custody as the commissioner of corrections, but also that we supervise in the community. And I want to back up something that um, the secretary said. Um, th these are folks, these are folks that deserve um, a high level of respect and dignity and um, who um, some folks have done really bad things in their lives. Um, some of these other folks um, come from very traumatized backgrounds. And our job in corrections is to move them from either, either being incarcerated to good citizens or help them in the community be good citizens and good neighbors and be productive. And the population we deal with is very, very challenging. And um, the reason why I say that is that's why it's important for us to be housed where we are. We depend on DIVA a lot uh, for healthcare coverage, for folks that transition out, mental health, a good chunk of our population have underlying mental health problems. Um, the Department of Health, um, a, you know, ADAM, uh, substance abuse. A good, a good number of our, our population suffer from substance abuse problems. And um, you know, we have a lot of success stories, and then we have a lot of heartbreaking stories. And um, you know, and I'll just leave you with this. Um, you know, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we we lost two people that we supervised in the community um, to overdoses, and I can tell you from talking to the staff that supervised them, how devastated they were. And I'll leave you with this because I didn't understand this until I became the commissioner. Uh, I'm very lucky to be where I am representing the folks that work in this system because the, what that lesson taught me was just how much our people invest in individuals that may not have had all the breaks in life that some of us have had and um, how hard it is when, when it doesn't work out. And so that population we deal with is very difficult. They have a lot of challenges in their lives and um, corrections is in place inside the human services for the sole purposes of being able to leverage those resources, leverage the resources inside human services to try to bring the best level support we can to individuals that we supervise and or are in our custody. So Senator Benning, I'll, I'll stop there and open it up for questions. And uh, I know you have other guests that are part of the committee. Um. Jim, I'm curious, the number 1,200 you used for the overall population right now, how's that number been going over the past year? Yeah, it's, tw it's 1,288, Senator. It's, it's going down. It's, it's down substantially. In fact, staff that's been in crisis for a while just shake their head at the numbers going down. And I think it's a combination of stuff. And I'm glad you asked me this because I want to touch on what you were talking about in, in the judicial system. Um, I think the effect for us is not gonna be seen until the system opens up because I think the numbers are down. Um, a big part of it is a lot of folks we transitioned out early on, not just us, but other parts of the system, courts resentenced people, parole board moved people along, um, um, but there's not a lot of people coming in the front end of the system on sentences. So we do have detainees, but because the system is held up, um, there are people out probably on conditions of release or bail or whatever the case may be that could eventually be found guilty in the system and sentenced to jail. So we're in a very, you know, we, we, it, it, it's worked out well for us that this number is low because of the way we operate the system to keep it clean from the virus. We have to have quarantine units in every one of our facilities around the state. Um, we have to keep beds open for that because it takes up a lot of space. But um, I think once the, once the system opens up, we may some, see some challenges as those numbers go up of detainees. Well, I'm just looking for a way to start chipping away at what inevitably will be a major problem for all of us. Mm -hmm. Starting at some place is why I brought that rant up. Got it. Um, committee, questions? Senator McCormick. Thanks. Could you uh, talk to us about COVID hygiene? COVID hygiene for the for the uh, folks in the facility halls in the facility. Yes. Yes. Look, um, we we our our protocols change almost daily. Not of late, but early on, as 
you know, we all became, came to understand the virus better. Um, it was remarkable to watch, Senator, as we took guidance from CDC, from Dr. Ledeen, from the health department. And there was a lot of, you know, conversations early on that we weren't provide, providing hygiene, cleaning materials, but I think we're over that now. Um, we do occasionally get into a situation where we may have a positive test and as we do the contact tracing, we don't know how, how much the facility is affected. So we'll lock it down. And when we lock it down, that limits the ability for folks in our custody to get to take showers and so on. But I believe we're providing <clears throat> what we need right now to make sure that the hygiene of the facilities, um, that, that the folks in our custody um, are able to maintain hygiene with the level of dignity that they deserve. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, by, COVID, by hygiene, I was referring to specifically to COVID hygiene. Or is that, how are you doing it? Just keeping, oh, you're seeing, you know, it's about often said you I'm couldn't sorry, ask for a worse, you're talking about you couldn't the ask. The facilities. Yes, at the facility. You couldn't yeah, ask for a worse situation, you know, in terms right. of large numbers of people forced to be in close quarters with one another. Right. So how, how are we handling that? Clean, 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 clean. Constantly cleaning. You know, following the guidelines that were put out early on. The other thing is um, we've created, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Army that works for us, who is a logistics person in the Army. We created our own supply line. And I, I kid, um, right down to a computerized, if we know we're using gloves at a given location, we know exactly how many gloves we got. We know what we have in supply. And um, I would put our supply line up against Walmart. The, the other thing I just wanted to add, um, the testing regime that Jim and his crew have put in is um, not, only, not only have people looked at it from other states, people have looked at it from other countries. Jim, you wanna talk about the testing regi regime because it's quite extensive. Yeah, and there's a, there's a little story that goes with that secretary, right? When, when, uh, when I didn't agree with you that we should be doing mandatory testing and uh, we, we had a conversation about that, but um, yeah, we, we, um, we, we right now are testing all our stock staff every two weeks and we test every facility every six weeks. If we get a positive test, and I'll use St. Johnsbury as an example. We had an inmate positive, which after working with the health department, we're not really sure if it was a positive or not, but it doesn't matter. We, we, we execute a protocol with the rapid response team where we do contact tracing, figure out who the individual had contact with, contact with. they quarantine immediately, much like the secretary's doing right now. Many times that's our staff. It drives our staff numbers down, which has put pressure on the system. But then we start following the protocol of testing seven, 14 and 21 days to make sure that those folks are, are, um, are, are coming back and, and the spread didn't happen any further in the facility. And so we get a lot of inquiries, not only nationally, but we also get a lot of um, inquiries uh, internationally working with several organizations about the protocols we put in place to keep the facilities clean. And, um, you know, I, I could spend a couple hours telling you the process. We, we meet every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at nine o'clock. Early on, we were meeting every day at nine o'clock and every day at noontime, just to keep our arms around the process. And so that's how we keep in the facilities clean, Senator. And the quarantining, anybody that comes into our system um, if we get a, a new arrest and it comes into our system, they're tested and quarantined for 14 days. Now there's a downside of that because of, of, of how they get isolated in the system. But we're also working through that right now as far as working with, with mental health folks about the isolation of individuals like that. Thank you. Committee, Committee. Senator Mazza. Many years ago, uh the governor had proposed uh, building uh, more facilities to reduce our out-of-state uh, uh, prisoners. And uh, I was very supportive of that. And uh, there was some opposition at that time. And I just wonder what your thoughts are because we deal with bricks and mortar. Is it the, is the long range future trying to get our folks back to the state uh, where they can have the programs and they're all gonna be eventually let out of the community. Well, most of them. 
and it would be nice if they were all in Vermont. But uh, so I didn't know what your thought was about uh, uh, thinking in the long range. Is it a desire to continue that movement of trying to get our facilities back located in Vermont and, and eliminate the out-of-state population? You know, the short answer to that, Senator, yes, it is. Um, you know, we, we, we've also dwindled the numbers in Mississippi. I think, please don't hold me exactly to this number, but I think we're at 184 right now. Wow. When I first got here, we were almost at 300. Nothing I've done. It's simply because the system has been, you know, the, the natural churn of the system, people leave and we've been able to bring people back. I believe there's a trip scheduled for the first week in February for three more to come back. Most of the folks coming back right now are either ending sentences or they're coming back for programs. So the goal would be to, in the long term to be thinking about a system in Vermont where you don't have to go back to having out of state population again. You know, I think in 2011, the number that sticks in my head is was there almost there was almost 600 people out of state. Right, right, right. And, you know, I, 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 I talk to I, I often get calls from families and I talk to them and um, when I talk to the families that have family members in Mississippi, it, 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 is, it is a burden. Yeah, and yeah. We know that people are successful on re-entry when they have a support system. And um, they're successful inside the facility when they have support systems. So that's a big piece of it. Um, along those lines, uh, you know, I, I, I've been pretty open about this with the support of the secretary and, and the governor's office. Um, you know. We, we need to have a conversation about the South Burlington facility sooner than later. We cannot wait any longer to have this conversation. Right, um, flipping for a long time, yeah. yeah. It's an old facility, it's very old. Yeah. And, and it's not meant to be what it is. No, no. So we've got the ability to do programming and get women, uh, the women, the female population is much different than the male population. And to get those folks to a place where we can do quality programming, there's a lot of good work going on inside that facility, but the building itself is not conducive to the kind of work we need to do. It's sure. no different than if you had an office building that wasn't designed to do office work. It's not designed to do what we need to do. It's in terrible shape. And I do think the feasibility study will be coming your way pretty soon. Um, here in Senate institutions, we're working in partnership with BGS now on that if you remember, there was two hundred fifty thousand dollars given for a feasibility study. We've been working on that, and uh, I've, I've seen a, an early draft of that, and it's uh, it's not done yet. But there's some unbelievable work being done to really lay out what's what's out there for deferred maintenance on that building in South Burlington, but also deferred maintenance throughout the system is 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 in the millions of dollars, and so you'll be seeing that soon. Um, you know, and that plays into this piece about what do you do to get population back, better, better program the women at the facility, and what's what's the what's the deal with the delayed maintenance on facilities around the state? How many women there now? Senator, I I, I um I believe we're somewhere in the ninety range. Yeah, because that, that, that ninety to one hundred time it was in the forties, which was pretty yeah. uh, you know not bad. Well, All of a sudden now it's up to the hundred. Right. And that does, there's no way you can accommodate 100 women. No. Ever, so it never paid for that. Remember, Senator, at one point, it was pushing 200. That's right. It was just not long ago. And um, that the facility, you know, like it's hard, you know, so I, I suspect we'll be having more of that conversation here as we move forward. Thank you. So you're, you're doing a pretty good job at dovetailing into our next witnesses. But before we get there, any other uh, committee questions? Um, we will also have you back to talk more about that report when it's completed, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot more substance. Um, two observations before you go. The um, facilities that you have now, I was listening to the secretary talking about his being at home in quarantine and what they had to have uh, the door opening and the meal gets shoved in it. Is there a place for him in case she boots him out at the end of the day? I, I, I think, sir, I can find him a room with a view. <clears throat> okay. Um, the other thing is, committee members, you may remember Rachel Feldman from uh, way back when Phil Scott was actually lieutenant governor. Is she still working for you? Yeah, she's, um, uh, she's my uh, principal assistant, but 
I, I refer to her as my babysitter center. She keeps me, uh, <laughs> she's actually texting me right now, straightening me out. Senator Mazi, there's 81 women at the facility now. This, this is why I need a principal assistant. Oh, well, no, I, just, I knew it was high. I can't keep it all straight, sir. <laughs> uh, norm normally, I would make some kind of a snarky remark like giving you my condolences, but she's got me on speed dial too, and I don't want to have to answer the call. We'll just say that we all miss her and leave it at that. How's that? Yeah, she's uh, she's a big support to me, sir. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I have to um, I have to go to another meeting, but I think um, Commissioner Baker is staying for the presentation. But I, I have to move on. I'm, I apologize. No, that's quite all right. Just don't leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Your wife Thanks. doesn't make a sandwich, Mike. Stop in. I'll feed you, okay? <laughs> I, I can't. I can't <laughs> stop in. <laughs> See you later. Send Bye take out. Thank you. Bye. Commissioner, you're welcome to stay or leave as uh, you choose. You're going to uh, move on to some more conversation, especially about the women's prison. I'll, I'll uh, stay at the center just in case folks have questions as a result of um, Timmy. Very good. presentation. Uh, Jen McDonald, Tom Doherty. Tom, is that how you pronounce your last name? Uh, it, it, it is, Senator. It's Tim Doherty, but um, Tim Doherty. You, got, you got the last name perfect. Yeah, I just didn't write down the, the I instead of an O on my piece of paper here. Um, you are both uh, part and parcel of a recent report that was sent to us regarding the women's facility. And I'm gonna go back to the original introductions this afternoon. We are really at a high level of trying to introduce new committee members, a new Senator, and for that matter, anybody from the public who may be watching this. So we're talking initially, at least from a very high level on how you've been involved in this discussion, what's going on at the facility. And this committee happens to deal with brick and mortar as opposed to policy decisions. So if you have brick and mortar conversation uh, involved in this report, we'd very much like to hear that part, especially with respect to the policy decisions that may be involved. You can touch on that a little bit, but I'll just keep in mind for everybody, this is Friday afternoon. I'm sure some folks want to get on the road for the weekend. So I'm not sure who wanted to go first. Tim, was that you or was that you, Jen? I can uh, lead off. I want to thank you, Senators, for having us today. Um, it's good to meet everyone. I regret that it's not in person every day now. Um, I get more and more weary of seeing faces on Zoom and not having the usual interactions. So um, again, I appreciate you having us. I, I have kind of an overview of the report that I can go through. Um, one of the things that Denise had asked is if uh, I could share my screen if folks don't have a copy of the report. So I'll, I'll ask what's easiest for you folks. Do you want me to share my screen? I, I don't plan to go through necessarily page for page, um, but if you don't have it in front of me, I'll put that up right now. I know that I do not have it in front of me because I'm at home and I left it at the office. So if you can do that, that would be great. And um, you can speed through it to touch on the highlights, how's that? So I will need um, Denise to enable my screen sharing, I believe. I just tried to do it. There we go. Okay, can everyone see, let me scroll to the top. The yes. Investigation? Yes. Okay. Um, it, it is also, I understand on the DOC website and, and I believe that it's uh, on the committee's page as well, but um, if at some point people want me to email this around, I can do that. Um, I, I will say that Primarily, this report has to do with the policy decisions and policy issues. The, the brick and mortar section in particular is uh, relatively brief, so we can skip to that. And, and at some point, I think Tim will address that, but I'll give a high level overview of what we were engaged to do and who we are. Um, I'm Jen McDonald. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm an attorney at Downs Rackley Martin. I work out of the Burlington office. And, and today, as you can see, I happen to be here 
although like everybody else, we're, we're moving between our homes and offices at this time. The investigation team was led by my partner, uh, Tristan Hoffman, who many of you know is the former U.S. Attorney for Vermont. Tris regrets that he wasn't able to be here today. And uh, Tim and I are here in his place. What the three of us made up the investigation team from DRM. My practice, uh, and Tim can touch on his practice. My law practice has to do with civil litigation in state and federal courts, primarily commercial, healthcare, um, fraud. And then I do investigations with this team here. Uh, and this has been. Uh, a privilege to work on. I believe Secretary Smith talked about the noble work that he gets to do on a daily basis. Um, and having a role in doing this certainly felt that way. It's, it's important work. Um, we hope will be meaning, provide meaningful uh, discussions and change uh, to better the people uh, really in particular who live in these facilities. Jen, before you be, uh, continue, I just want to point out for the benefit of Senator Ingalls, as well as anybody from the public that may be watching, it is not unusual that this committee and virtually every other committee in the building uh, will be faced with an issue or a question or a problem that has to be dealt with uh, by an outside source of some kind. And we ask for reports to be done to address the issues that are in front of us so that we can digest it a whole lot more with some expertise from the outside. And in this particular situation, um, we asked this group of folks who came from Downs, Rackland, and Martin to investigate the women's prison situation. And it is not unusual for this committee to bring people back in and give us a full report on what they actually found when they did it. And that's a common form of what we do in the government um, in the legislature that is, to ask for these reports to come back. And this committee will from time to time take more substantive conversation, but based on the report that's presented to us, we may end up having you folks come back at a later time as we dive into bigger questions about, okay, now we understand what the scope of the problem is. What are the proposals that are in front of us to do something about it? Thanks. No, thank you for that clarification. Um, and, I, and I was going to touch on that because it's a really important feature here is this, you know, obviously uh, Tim and I and Tris, we work for the law firm down to Rackham Martin. We were hired by the state to do an independent investigation. Um, we came at that from this angle. Our, our goal here was to get to the bottom of the issues that were flagged by the media. Prior to that, I know that the uh, Vermont Women's Legislative Caucus had made it a preeminent issue for them, I believe, starting in 2018. And our job was to take a look and see um, if we could really get to the bottom of these issues to de determine, are they systemic? What else is out there? Identify not only the things that were flagged by the media, but um, issues around culture, training, um, and primarily at the facility level, we looked at the Chittenden County facility, but obviously many of the issues that we discuss in our report, aside from the specific issues related to the women, have implications across the board for corrections in Vermont. We had uh, complete cooperation from the agency and the facility, the agency being uh, Agency of Human Services. We had cooperation when we requested documents from the Department of Human Services. We had complete cooperation, <laughs> excuse me, from everyone at the facility level, from management to staff and everywhere in between. We came at this from the perspective of, we want to get all the documents that we can get, review all of that information, look at the policy issues and prepare a comprehensive report that, that can be used to assist um, the state, the legislature, the public in understanding what was going on. We worked, uh, we retained uh, the Moss Group, who this committee may know. It's a uh, national firm that is an expert in corrections. Andy Moss uh, is very familiar with the Department of Corrections here in Vermont and has done um, trainings and other um, independent investigations throughout the, uh, I, 
I'm going to say past 15 years, she has periodically come into Vermont and I believe is now again consulting with the DOC. Uh, their cooperation was um, just phenomenal to have that type of expertise in looking at the facility and going into the facility and structuring it in a way that we could ensure that we were getting comprehensive information. We had the goal throughout of being available to anyone who wanted to communicate with this investigation. Um, that took careful strategic planning on our part in making sure that we were accessible to both the public. Uh, mm -hmm. and the if COVID uh, was obviously a challenge because we wanted to make sure that we could meet with people in person and get a great cross section of the people who, the women who are living in the facility so that we could really identify the issues. Um, I believe the investigation officially started last January, so a year ago, and, and unfortunately because of the pandemic, there was some delay in that and starting again this fall with testing and again, the cooperation of everyone in the facility, we were able to get in there. Um, principally, Tim Doherty with the Moss Group was able to have focus groups and meet with whoever staff residents wanted to meet with this investigation. Jen, I'm gonna have to interrupt you again and ask my committee assistant, Denise, to let Commissioner Baker back into the room. He's apparently in the waiting room. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Again, you know, we really were looking at this from the policy standpoint. I, I want to make sure that it's clear. It is in our report. Our role was not to re-adjudicate um, individual instances of sexual assault, harassment, and misconduct. Uh, however, we did, and you'll see this in the report, um, and I can show you some examples and how it's laid out uh, at page 35, we start with some exemplary allegations. So we did look at specific instances, but our role was not to serve as a re uh, independent adjudicator of those instances. Um, in the situations that we did come um, to learn about situations that had not been previously reported either to DOC or the Vermont State Police, we made sure to make those appropriate referrals. Um, the report is organized uh, in a way that hopefully it's, it's easy for the public to read it if they so choose. There is a section on our findings and then a section on our recommendations. Um, I want to make sure again that I'm using everyone's time in the most efficient manner possible. So I, I, I'm going to skip to the findings uh, starting specifically at page 47 with respect to the physical facility um, Kim, who was in that physical facility. Uh, he, he's been there prior to our investigation and was there part of the, as part of the focus groups can speak to what Commissioner Baker was just discussing. Um, and so I'll, I'll let him jump in and talk about our findings with respect to that physical plan. Thanks, Jen. And, um, uh, uh, Chairperson Benning and Senators on the committee and Commissioner Baker. Um, uh, my name is Tim Doherty. I'm also uh, a lawyer at DRM and a partner of Jim McDonald's and Tris Coffin. I've um, been here since 2017. Uh, prior to joining the law firm for 10 years, uh, I was a federal prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Burlington. Um, and let me just echo uh, what Jen said. Uh, it, it was a tremendous uh, privilege uh, to work on this um, investigation, uh, and it's a real privilege to testify uh, in front of your committee here today. Um, as Jen said, the, the focus of our investigation um, was on the policy ramifications of uh, sexual abuse and sexual misconduct um, at CRCF. Um, and uh, as a result, we, we did not be charged with doing a comprehensive um, assessment of the facility itself. Um, but in exploring those policy issues arising from the sexual misconduct allegations, um, we explored issues regarding um, um, morale um, at the facility in, in great detail. Um, as I'm sure 
senators can imagine, um, having spoken to as many people as we did, um, views differ greatly um, depending upon who you talk to. Um, but I will say this, um, that from high level DOC management folks down to um, newly minted COs, to the women who live in the facilities, um, to the non-governmental service providers uh, who provide such vital services at CRCF, there was near unanimity um, on the need to uh, explore a new facility, uh, given the age, uh, given the physical um, limitations uh, of the facility. Commissioner Baker said it earlier, uh, CRCF was not designed to be a uh, a prison in the way it's being used now, and um, you, you know, so from so from virtually everyone, if not everyone, um, we, we heard that message. Um, the phys the physical plant uh, affects morale, and that has a ripple effect. The physical plant affects the rehabilitative services that DOC can provide. Um, although they do they, they do make heroic efforts to, to work with what they have. Um, and you know, we're happy to answer questions about that. It was not the focus of our report, but it was a commonly articulated theme throughout our investigation. Um, and I think Jen mentioned, I myself spent three days uh, this fall uh, in the facility um, facilitating some, of, some aspects of our investigation um, and, and was able to experience the facility for myself firsthand. Another thing that I'll add to that, in addition to the facility, the other crossover section that, that relates to both policy considerations and also possibly what this committee is charged with is the surveillance system that we encountered. Um, it's not technically brick and mortar, but it is certainly um, a feature that contributes to the policy implications. Not too long ago, um, there was only something on the number of maybe 63 cameras that has now been significantly expanded, uh, but there are still technological issues that exist uh, in a way that impacts the ability of the cameras to function at all times necessary to record what's going on in that facility. Um, another component of that, and this is in the CREO reports, uh, not specifically our report, but obviously we had to refer to the PREA, uh, PREA for the, the purpose of the committee, and then also those who may be watching on YouTube is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which is just critical to everything that um, the policy implications here for law uh, regulating what happens. Uh, so with respect to that, many, many instances of sexual misconduct happen within um, the individual's um, cells that their women reside in, there oftentimes are not cameras in those locations. And so that creates a situation where if reported, um, it is a resident's word against a staff's word, creating all sorts of uh, implications, uh, including fear of retaliation from both that staff uh, and then other staff as we saw when we met with people. Uh, another issue with the cameras, this is not brick and mortar, but obviously relates to our recommendations for the body cameras on the individual people that do account, uh, the staff that does account for um, an inability possibly to put a camera in every single location on the brick and mortar facility. Um, and then the issues that would arise from those surveillance cameras only operating if uh, there was sufficient motion to trigger the motion detection. Uh, so again, we didn't get so into the weeds to know how much motion is required to trigger those surveillance cameras, but what we were able to determine uh, is it's clear that that does not pick up every interaction between a staff and a resident, even if there is a camera in that vicinity. Excuse me. So Jen, just for your edification, this committee would be responsible for um, facility cameras, body cameras, I wouldn't normally think would fall within our jurisdiction, but if the plan is to bring them about, uh, it may very well come within our jurisdiction somewhere down the road. Um, I didn't, Tim, I don't know if you have anything more to tell us at this uh, 10,000 foot level, however many thousand feet you want to call it. 
Senator, we're really here for you, for, for you and the committee. And, and, and I know Jen and I are happy to answer whatever questions you have. And I, we want to make the best use of your time as possible. So please. Okay. So the initial question that I have with respect to cameras is, do you, are you making a recommendation that all officers wear body cameras and that those cameras are on at all times? Yes, that's a, that's a strong recommendation and a really important one. Something that we encountered repeatedly was um, uh, issue, situations being reported and being able to either substantiate, unsubstantiate, or determine that they were unfounded. Um, we have seen, and this, this would not be a first, the first time that it's ever happened where uh, staff within a facility would be required to wear body cameras. So we are seeing that in other jurisdictions. Um, I, I think the most recent one that we saw was a uh, prison that was being ordered to do in California. That takes uh, many of the issues away. It allows people to feel secure in the facility. It allows um, residents and to be confident that uh, what they are saying can be validated. It allows staff to be confident that if a report is made against them and is unfounded, that can also be determined with a level of clarity that does not currently exist. Um, so as, assuming that we follow through with that suggestion, does that relieve some of the need to have, for instance, a camera in every cell? I think it would, because again, that, and that, that allows for some privacy at much needed times. Obviously a camera in every cell is, um, is, is problematic for having that uh, autonomy that people should have even within uh, a correctional situation. But if they are involved in an interaction, if a resident is involved in any interaction with a staff, that would be a recorded interaction. And, and so I think your point is really well taken, Senator. Yeah, I, I thought when you were talking initially about cameras in every cell that part of the um, anxiety, I guess, you, if you will, of people who are actually incarcerated is the concept that they don't have any privacy. So I was getting a little nervous about the idea of planting a camera in every room that just exacerbates the uh, emotions and the anxiety of the people that are working in the building. That's a great point. Um, committee, questions? I can't yes. see Senator um, Corey Parent on my screen. Can we take down the, um, the screen sharing? Sorry, Joe, my internet's been cutting in and out, so I've been popping the video off to save it. No, you just, your block, Corey, wasn't on my screen at all. I mean, I know you're there, but I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, my screen only has one, two, three, four, five, six people on it. And there's more than that in this conversation. There we go. Okay. Senator McCormick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to comment on the efficacy of, of the body cameras by way of an analogy. But 25 years ago, I was on the Judiciary Committee when we first started considering a DNA bank. And um, my civil libertarian instincts said, this is a bad idea. This is big brother. This is just, you know, and, and one of the people advocating for the DNA bank said, well, this will not just catch the bad guys. This will help exonerate the innocent. And at the time I thought, well, that's a smoke screen. This is big brother. But in fact, we have this very big, very effective innocence project where the DNA is used to prove innocence. I would think the same thing with the body cameras is that on the one hand, we have seen episodes where the body cameras have provided the proof that the law enforcement officer behaved badly. And it's good that we have that proof. But on the other hand, I know that people, because I get my constituent mail, there are people who worry about corrections officers going to work, doing their job, and having someone make a false accusation. And, and this would provide exoneration as well as, as, as proof of guilt. Basically, what you, the, the overarching term being the truth. You get to know what actually happened. So I think that's, a, that's an encouraging 
development. I, I think we agree with that, Senator. I also think it's important for the committee to understand that um, our recommendation with respect to the use of cameras is only part and parcel of a greater uh, suite of recommendations regarding uh, policy changes, um, uh, training changes, uh, and, and other recommendations that we that we uh, that we make in our report. We'll talk about those to the extent that committee wants to today, but it, we are not advocating that cameras are a panacea, um, just as just as they aren't, you know, for for law enforcement officers out on the street. Um, they have to be part and parcel of a much more holistic uh, approach, to be sure. By way of brick and mortar, do you have any other recommendations that we should be putting in the back of our heads for consideration? Again, the new facility, I understand that there uh, are reports coming out. And again, we look at very high levels uh, at the facility issues. The, the only uh, other component of the report uh, that I would draw your attention to is the work being done between UVM, uh, specifically Dr. Fox and um, Superintendent Messier, looking at what's being done in the name of the Kevin Reconstruction Facility. We interviewed many people, not just Dr. Fox and um, Superintendent Messier, who talked about the main facility as a model that should be a guiding model for Vermont. And again, I don't, I don't profess to know what's in the feasibility studies that are being discussed other than what was discussed by the witnesses. But that main model is something that they aspire to. Okay. Well, I appreciate the conversation about the cameras. That's a, that's something we're all going to have to be thinking about at some point on the committee moving forward. Committee, any other questions? I don't see any hands. I see a lot of people who want to get their weekend started. Well, thank Jen, you. Tim, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, don't be surprised if we call you back at some point for some more clarification, but appreciate you coming and spending some time with us today. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate it. Thank you to the committee and, and thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Baker, I was uh, probably five seconds after your conversation left, I got texted from you know who. <laughs> right. I, uh, I, got, I got thrown off. I don't know. I had a problem with my internet, so I, I lost connection. So we didn't do it. We didn't do it. I think, I think Senator Maz was sick of looking at this. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to call the live version of this committee. You're welcome to leave us, but Denise. I'd like to have you stay on the.